Okay, well, we're gonna get started. Um, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us virtually again. Um, apologies that we can't be in person, but we wanted to make sure that we're keeping everyone's um, safety and health uh, at the top of our minds. So thanks for joining us virtually. Um, and I wanna thank my team, our Vice President, Ken Scott, our Treasurer, Mauricio Rodriguez, our Secretary, Zach Beal, and our past President, Todd Huser, for all of their help in um, keeping our uh, chapter running smoothly. And I also certainly wanna thank our sponsors, uh, HL Restoration, Delta Innovative Services, Image Flooring, Surf Pro, Certa Pro Painters of Shawnee Mission, Hallmark, Unity Village, RUI, John Marshall Company, Seasonal Solutions, Stanger, Garmin, and Herman Miller. Without their support, uh, we would have a tough time uh, being able to do all of the fun and exciting events that we have planned for the year. And speaking of events that we have planned, mark your calendars. Um, coming up in February, we've got Coffee and Connections on the 4th, our monthly meeting on the 15th. Another Coffee and Connections, uh, March 4th, and our monthly meeting on the 15th. April 1st, Coffee and Connections. April 14th, our second annual Egg Hunt and Happy Hour. We had a great time last year. The weather worked out for us. Um, so hopefully we will have the same um, exciting time again this year. And uh, that Egg Hunt, lots of people got some good prizes with that. Um, so if you're thinking about uh, wanting to provide a donation for that, contact uh, Ash McReynolds and she can help coordinate with that. Um, April, oh, and then we've just got the rest of our monthly meetings there. So um, I want to um, let you know that we are working as a uh, leadership team on our uh, strategic platform and we've postponed that now just because of COVID, we wanna meet in person, but we're gonna postpone that just a little bit. Hopefully we'll be able to meet in February um, to keep going on that strategic planning. And uh, right now, I would like to turn it over to Josh Woods, who is going to introduce our speaker this month. Thanks, Julie. Good morning, all. If my KC members, sponsors, and our special guests for today. Happy New Year and welcome to our first um, program of 2020. Uh, we're excited about today's program presentation and the importance and relevance to the city of Kansas City and to each and every one of us here today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, John Stevens. Uh, John is the president and CEO of Port KC. Uh, John is an economic development professional who has spent his career focused on utilizing thoughtful development concepts to improve the community. He's a passionate about Kansas City and has built a reputation for creativity and collaboration. John previously served as president of one of the largest urban redevelopment districts in America, director of economic development for Kansas City, Kansas, and CEO of Visit KC. As an entrepreneur, John has guided boards and corporations to innovative success. John is a University of Missouri alum, which we won't hold against him, uh, a frequent speaker on civic issues and is an active board member for many organizations, including Visit KC, KC Streetcar, KCPT, Arts KC, and the KC ADC. John, thank you for spending time with us today and welcome to IFMA KC. We're excited to have you and hear more about the role that Port KC plays in the community and the planning and development at the Berkeley Riverfront and all the big things going on with Port KC. Just real quick before I turn it over to John, um, I want to uh, make sure that we all mute our, our microphones and please utilize the chat feature uh, to chat in any questions you may have. And then at the end of John's presentation, Rose will take us through a Q&A session. So without further ado, take it away, John. Perfect, thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone. I, uh, I, as I think we've all learned over the last couple years of COVID that it's all about adjusting and adapting uh, in, the, in the age of Zoom and the age of presentation. So I uh, apologize for my delay, had a uh, a quick t COVID exposure contact tracing test to, to do right before this. Negative, again, um, I joke that I feel like uh, 
Keanu Reeves in the Matrix dodging COVID at this point. Um, but uh, I hope everyone's uh, uh, healthy and safe and uh, appreciate you allowing me to take the time to talk to all of you. I'll, I'll say I'm gonna try to run through um, uh, efficiently and effectively um, on what we do, uh, but please, all questions are encouraged uh, and I will do my best to, uh, to jump right through those as we get to, to that time. So um, a little bit about port. Uh, we are we are the Port Authority of Kansas City. We're one of 14 port authorities uh, created and in 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 use in the state of Missouri. Uh, we are a transportation logistics agency at heart. That's what we do. That's what we uh, strive for. And our goal is to create a more globally connected and competitive Kansas City. Uh, our port district. Everyone always asks, is well, what is the port responsible for? Well. Um, our actual uh, logistics from a legal standpoint is the city limits of Kansas City, Missouri. So we operate throughout the city limits of Kansas City, Missouri. That is our designated port district. Uh, however, I'm lucky enough, uh, I, I heard in the introduction, you know, the, the comment about Mizzou, uh, but I will say truly a bi-state and regional player that while we operate in Kansas City, Missouri alone. I'm actually on uh, the, the Federal National Waterways Council appointed by the state of Kansas, by Governor Kelly uh, and that team. We work closely with really the entire region uh, and actually through the entire navigation highway of M29, which is the Missouri uh, River to the Mississippi River and on down to global connectivity at uh, Port of Plaquemines, Louisiana. So we are a a unique governmental agency. We're a port authority. Uh, we also are state enabled. However, we are uniquely Kansas City in that I report to a seven member board of directors appointed by the mayor of Kansas City. Uh, and we're uh, 15, 15 full-time employees strong from logistics, legal, finance, and development, which I'll touch on a little bit uh, because part of our mission is to redevelop land, reclaim land, uh, and put it back with public-private partnership into use for jobs. And then we reinvest uh, all of our revenues back into uh, transportation and logistics infrastructure. So this is our port district, the light green. We're an independent government agency. Uh, we work for Kansas City and we are a 100% self-funded agency. Uh, so that's a very unique one. All of our uh, revenues and resources come from uh, bond finance development and uh, uh, revenue derived from the projects that we that we uh, run and partner with. So the first one, uh, those of you who have spent any time in Kansas City, if you're familiar with South Kansas City, uh, you might remember the Richards Gebauer Air Base uh, at, a, at basically 49 Highway, the old 71 Highway, uh, and 150 Highway. Uh, so this is in South Kansas City. The Honeywell facility, the incredible NNSA facility is just to the north of us. And we uh, took on the Bracked Air Force Base of Richard Skabauer. And with our partners at Platform Ventures, partners at North Point, uh, and private development partners, we continue to redevelop the site. And our goal here is to monitor and maintain uh, the environmental uh, also partner with the intermodal facility with Kansas City Southern as they go through their merger with Canada Pacific and continue to, to keep this facility vibrant uh, while also redeveloping this. And our ultimate goal is to bring back the full number of jobs that were here when this was a functioning air base for the region. So that's around 5,000 jobs. Another one that we're really excited about is the Missouri River Terminal. This is the Blue River Corridor. So those of you that are familiar with Sugar Creek, Missouri, 435, if you head north on 435 uh, and you cross the Missouri River headed to Claycomo and, and the Northland, uh, this is uh, land, this is the former AK Steel site. We did a, a reversionary land sale, 420 acres approximately, and we are now in the late stages of issuing, of getting ready to issue a uh, P3 RFQ to redevelop this as the Missouri River Terminal, Marine Rail Truck. This will be a standalone independent 
agnostic infrastructure, similar to think about KCI uh, for for uh, commercial traffic or for uh, you know air traffic. This will be a trucking facility, rail facility, and the a full port facility with cranes moving goods and services between the three uh, the three um, types of intermodal transit. This was deemed needed, uh, and I think we're seeing it so much more as we move our supply, as we see in the supply chain disruptions throughout the world, really, um, and our 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 market analysis of the of the uh, of the need for this is to accommodate the growth of TEUs, the 20 foot equivalent shipping containers into the Kansas City region. To give you an idea for those of you who uh, don't spend a lot of time in logistics and, and uh, distribution, Kansas City is now the 15th largest distribution center with 300 million square feet of private uh, warehouse logistics facilities and growing at an exponential rate by 2030, we're expected to double the number of shipping containers in and out of the Kansas City region. And so as I like to say, imagine then twice as many semis on I-70. Imagine twice as many rail cars on the rail system. It's great that we have this, that we are the heartland and the center of the logistics hub. But uh, if we don't have and continue to deepen our waterborne commerce in order to give different goods, uh, the ability to move in all of the different methods, uh, we're gonna be hindering ourselves. So our goal is to develop, this is about a $500 million uh, public-private partnership project that will place uh, the ability to use the vessels you see in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, uh, which are being designed and built uh, in this now uh, these are new vessels that are basically small versions of the giant shippers that you see coming through the Panama Canal and coming into the port of Long Beach and other places. But these will be able to navigate all the way up to, the, to our terminal. Uh, and there will be terminals in St. Louis, Memphis, and other places. And each one of these will carry about 1,250 shipping containers. So these will be able to, to utilize our full waterborne uh, navigation channels. So we're very excited about this because this helps unlock the potential of the Blue River Corridor. For those of you who don't know the history, you know, the last century, the Blue River Corridor was the industrial center of, can of the region. It was steel plants and factories, the Leeds plant. That's where the original auto manufacturers, the first Ford plant outside of Detroit was built in the Blue River Corridor. So our goal is to really unlock and reclaim this as the next century's jobs corridor for light manufacturing uh, and distribution. So we're really excited about that because it also supports the neighborhoods in Independence, in Eastern Jack, uh, and in Eastern KCMO, those neighborhoods that were built pre-war and some early post-war to accommodate uh, the workforce. So a little bit more, um, I'm gonna take a step back. Those are two key projects that we're working on, uh, but I'm gonna take a step back and talk a little bit about our overall industry and logistics. Uh, we work uh, both at 49 Crossing with land that we own and, and reclaim as well as the MRT facility uh, but we additionally, we work with private developers to bring to bear projects that bring uh, light manufacturing, distribution, and jobs. So we're really excited uh, to, we've, uh, if you're familiar with the CVS facility in the Northland, uh, we did the um, projects there. Uh, we've compelled uh, data centers with Hunt Midwest and projects there and, and light industrial, as well as a new Niagara bottling plant to accommodate the uh, growth of uh, bubbly water, of uh, flavored waters and, and facilities like that. That, uh, to give you an idea, will come online uh, late, I believe late this year in the Northland. Uh, it is a, almost a $200 million capital investment of manufacturing equipment to do um, uh, bubbly and flavored waters for the nation. And uh, that, will, that will include 150 plus jobs that are high quality, high paying jobs. 
Additionally, um, if you're familiar with the old Bendix plan, I'm from South Kansas City originally, I call it Bendix still, but 95th and 95th Bannister and Troost uh, was the old NNSA facility that was privately with public private dollars remediated, cleared up, uh, and North Point development is now uh, in the late stages of bringing seven new buildings to that site. That also includes uh, within part with partnership with South Town Chamber and us and full employment. It includes a workforce center for the community as well. Uh, we also were able at the end of last year to approve Alpla, which is a injection molding manufacturing facility that needed rail service on that site. So we're excited to bring additional quality jobs that uh, hold the potential for significant growth uh, in the Kansas City region in the years to come. Um, so a little bit about the other terminal that we currently operate. So in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a rendering of this large 400 plus acre facility in eastern uh, Kansas City. But we currently operate the fastest growing port in the Midwest on six acres in the West Bottoms. So we took uh, six years ago. Uh, we took, it was actually before I joined port, uh, but we took a decommissioned uh, port terminal in the West Bottoms and uh, brought it back to life, have reactivated it, have invested $25 million into the facility. And it is now the fastest growing facility in the Midwest. You can see some of what is done here. This is um, uh, rebar, steel, uh, steel scrap going to facilities out of Kansas City uh, and fertilizer. If you, the, probably the thing you will notice that's most visible uh, if you drive between around downtown, you'll see two large white domes, these big white domes. Collectively, those hold 14,000 tons of uh, commercial fertilizer for the large agriculture uh, grow, grow farms all over the Midwest. Uh, right now, this port. Uh, serves 50% of the fertilizer capacity for farmers in eastern Kansas and northern Missouri. So we continue to grow that and we continue to use a lot of reclaimed materials that are going into and out of manufacturing facilities in Kansas City. Since uh, it's a little bit warmer today, but since we just had a snow event, I'll highlight the bottom left-hand corner and you'll see rail cars. We, we have rail spurs into this facility we were able to do a really creative partnership here with a, a company called Scottwood Industries. And they have uh, tanks that they've placed on the site and they bring in um, the liquid mixture for the road applications, for the road salt. When you have freeze cycles, the pre-applicant that um, uh, cities put down on the roads. That's a mix of, of actual salt of the hard surface and then the liquid mix. So the uh, salt is brought in on barge, the liquid is brought in on rail, they're mixed right here in the West Bottoms and then distributed out by truck to all of the different entities that then use uh, to apply the uh, road melt facility or, or road melt service. So really excited about it. That's been a really great growth um, and it's a, it's a great use for a facility like this. We, as we bring the MRT facility, uh, since that will be much more higher value good, shipping containers and, and services there with cranes and else, we will continue to utilize the West Bottoms facility for bulk goods services uh, because we do around 300,000 tons a year out of this facility, uh, usually nine to 10 months a year given the river cycle. We do have a little bit of downtime traditionally with ice. Uh, ice flow on the river, uh, but it stayed pretty clear through the course of the uh, of the years. So now probably a little bit closer to home where I'm sitting right now uh, is the uh, Berkeley Riverfront. So I'm going to go into a deeper dive on Berkeley Riverfront, um, but I want to touch on it with this slide and say that we do um, uh, all aspects of verticals of development from multifamily to uh, office, to mixed use, and uh, redevelopment as, long, as well as with partners with rail, trails, the streetcar. Uh, we're funding the streetcar for the riverfront extension. 
And so we're very excited about the future of the riverfront. So for today's presentation, uh, you'll see a teaser here and then I'll dive into it a little more uh, that'll hopefully spur some interesting questions uh, from, the or from, the, from the group. So you can see here, uh, the CVS facility, Northland Park 7, uh, the Northland Park facilities. Uh, we've done around, uh, I was looking at it, around 20 million square feet of development uh, in the pipeline in the, in the three years, just over three years that I've been in the team. And we're really excited about uh, where we're headed. So as I said, here's the Niagara facility. Uh, average salary is at 59,000. It's a $210 million project. Uh, these are the type of projects we want. We want uh, investment with access to jobs, quality jobs, and longevity of jobs. Projects that aren't going to join higher up and then, uh, and then downsize or lay off Kansas Cityans. We want long-term uh, re relationships here. And this is a 600, almost 650,000 square feet foot facility. Additionally, um, we, we do, uh, we do um, multifamily. This was actually where uh, the power and light uh, project, which uh, when in my intro, uh, it was mentioned that um, I, I served as a lead for a urban redevelopment. I was president of Cordish Midwest, the power and light district when we, uh, when Kansas City, when we partnered to build that project. So very, um, very excited. Um, very, very excited about uh, that project and what, what we were able to accomplish there. So this one was interesting. Uh, this was a backfill from downtown uh, on the what used to be the uh, floodplain right on the Missouri River at Highway 9 in the Northland. We were able to work with a great developer, development partner, Briarcliff, obviously not known for having, uh, quote, affordable housing. Uh, so we were able to work with this developer and help bring a project to life uh, that actually 15% of the units uh, are set aside for those uh, earning 70% or less of the average median income in Kansas City. So when this project opens, 15% of the units will be designated affordable for young professionals and workforce in the community. That's the type of uh, thing we aspire to as we look to bring multifamily projects together. We can't solve all of it, but we can play a role in incremental benefits of making sure that uh, there are uh, quality set-asides in, in units all over, uh, all over the area that are accessible for young professionals and, and uh, the workforce that we need. So now a little bit, I saw somebody, I love all the chats. So I appreciate, please keep it up. That, that keeps me energized when I hear, see all these, these comments. Um, and uh, I saw one, yeah, Niagara actually did receive uh, some exemptions and some incentives around uh, how, what they're doing for um, uh, the environment and what they're doing for uh, energy efficiency and energy savings, uh, as well as their growth. They actually uh, have the potential to grow to an additional line uh, to run additional shifts and additional uh, units out of that. It's a really incredible facility. So a deeper look on the riverfront. This, um, and, and please feel free to give me a warning when I'm out of time because I could talk for days on all of this. Um, but this land, uh, the, the Berkeley Riverfront land, I think people forget that this literally was a dump. It was the, the foundation of Kansas City. It was where the original uh, economic development came up out of the river with, with river boats uh, because there was a natural limestone shelf that was used as an unloading spot. Then Main Street was dug out of the hill side and built into and south to, that created downtown Kansas City. So what happened then was the rail came in and rail has been a backbone of creating Kansas City and the metropolis that, that we have now, thankfully. But rail comes in on, they, you know, rail can't climb. It can't climb and descend very easily. Um, so they needed flat land. So rail developed along the, the riverbed and along the, the, the river banks. So you'll see the rail that came in. Well, then what transpired with rail and river is exactly what we're doing at MRT for the future, uh, but it happened 100 plus years ago. And that was things such as 
uh, fact, you know, factories that needed water, services that needed manufacturing uh, and cooling of the water, and then power plants. So when this land uh, developed, it was a great economic engine. Then the industries all grew. And then what happened here on this 80 plus acres was it became a coal gasification plant. It became an area, yes, and they did gasify coal in the past. And it became an area where they dumped uh, the uh, coal slag and the remnants of the coal. And then it became a tow lot in more modern history in the 50s and 60s. And then in the, uh, when the, those of you who are old enough, I'm showing my age, those of you who are old enough to remember when Kemper Arena's roof collapsed, uh, they dumped the old roof here, right in the center of Berkeley, what is now Berkeley Riverfront. And uh, this became a dump. And uh, through great thoughtful partners like uh, now Congressman Cleaver and others, they saw the future of reclaiming the riverfront like other cities have done. And I'm happy to say that that investment has paid off because now we are accelerating and becoming a real destination uh, over the next few years. So we developed a the Berkeley Riverfront Park that Port KC owns and manages, the trail network that connects to the town of Kansas Bridge. Uh, it, um, we've developed the Union Berkeley, which is actually where our offices are, which was the first housing to be built on the Missouri River in Kansas City, Missouri in more than 110 years when it opened six years ago. I'm happy to say now, by the end of this year, we will have 1,600 citizens living in Berkeley Riverfront, and the full development is on pace for probably a 10-year build-out cycle, which is, in the world of economic development, that's lightning speed. And our uh, style has changed with the streetcar, with now the Casey Current Stadium, which I'm gonna touch on. Um, this neighborhood, and it will truly be the Berkeley Riverfront neighborhood uh, at full build out will be almost 6 million square feet. And the next buildings, uh, the next two buildings uh, will be eight to nine stories. The buildings after that will be 10 to 14 stories on average uh, as we continue to develop out this mixed use walkable neighborhood. So now let's talk a little bit about the bookend. Uh, very, very excited that Chris and Angie Long and Brittany Matthews, who's, she's, uh, her partner is some, I think he plays football. Uh, uh, maybe maybe it's a Mahomes somebody, um, but we think of Brittany as the co-owner of the KC Current NWSL team. We started working uh, with Chris and Angie uh, right after they bought the team in Utah and moved it back to Kansas City. And um, we started working with them on what a vision of a, the first purpose-built stadium for a professional women's team in the world would look like. And it's exciting in multiple ways, but I can say that um, Chris and Angie Long, myself and others uh, were committed from day one to placing a facility in the heart of our city that's accessible to all corners of our city, accessible to the fans throughout the city, and to make it world-class, truly world-class. A facility that doesn't, you know, make it something that is, well, we're going to do a little something for women who play sports. No, it was, we're going to set a standard that women, uh, that, that, the, that the athletes, that the female athletes deserve every bit as much, and if not more, than what we see in other, in other sports facilities. So what you were gonna see um, is what we came up with. And with um, the partners uh, in Riverside, uh, Chris and Angie uh, partnered with the city of Riverside to build their practice facility. The practice facility that's under construction in Riverside, Missouri is going to be a world-class facility for these athletes. And then they will jump across the river and play at an 11,500 seat world-class stadium that is on the riverfront and in the middle of, uh, of, of our city. 
And um, I'm just, I, you, you, you will hear me, I, I'm so excited about what this means because the urban planner in me says this is also a catalyst. We're nesting this all the way up against the Bond Bridge and against the highway in a way that makes this energetic and makes it a bookend for the uh, Barquet and all the development in the river market on the west side. And then this stadium that is oriented to the park and to the river from the east side. And then we're gonna have this incredible walkable development in the middle. It also will be a facility that is designed without any permanent parking. All of the parking will be 2000 spaces will be temporary when it opens. Those spaces will then be replaced as development, as the iterative development comes online and the land where the parking is, is developed, there will be shared parking garages with air rights and development above and guests will visit and park there. The development is also designed in such a way uh, that this will be marketed and positioned as ride park and ride the streetcar, ride uh, multimodal and transit to this site. So I'm gonna run through a little bit of the site. Here is the rendering. And this site is going to, we are on schedule to break ground in July of this year. So this is going to be coming out of the ground very quickly. So you can see a little bit of the facility. You can see how it will be oriented to the park, all the glass, the, the, the indoor outdoor space. This will be designed also to be a facility that is used and actually designed and programmed through our master land, land lease 60 to 80 nights a year. So it'll be used for the NWSL team. It will be their home, but it will also be used for women's national team, for collegiate sports, for um, other uh, professional women's sports and other professional sports and concerts and events. It's designed from the ground up to be used for concerts and events. So here's some of the views of the stadium. Uh, it will have a lot of premium seating, a lot of specialty seating. It will have a really long bar across the north end. And it's designed by the fans for the fans. You can see how it's going to be really built to be fan, fan oriented. And you can see the ground level. It's built to be clear and have a, a feeling of cohesiveness to the neighborhood. So along those lines, what does that mean for the riverfront? Well, as I said, five and a half million square feet. So huge amount of dense development that's walkable. Those of you who have been to um, uh, the Navy Yard in DC around where the National Stadium is, it's similar in context to that. The, um, it will have mid-block connectors, pedestrian connectors. The garages will be internalized. The sidewalks will be walkable. The roads will be narrow with on-street parking. The streetcar will be breaking ground. It will come to mid park and we'll have a double load modern streetcar drop off. Uh, we are building a bike ped bridge, a multi-million dollar bike ped bridge to connect the river market. It's a 14 foot wide bridge designed just for bikes and pedestrians to connect folks. All of the parking will be shared parking as we go forward. Um, we are allowing flexibility for public-private partnership. We're designing this with the city and, and in partnership with the city to be the creative test bed for sustainability, for affordability, for solar, for water generation, power generation from, from the river. Uh, so we're looking at all of this and making it connected of transit, recreation, and conservation. So um, it's one of the questions that's constantly asked is, well, with all this development, is the park going to be developed? No. The Berkeley Park is an absolute amenity that part of a condo association we've created with all this development. It is designed to always be. This front yard for downtown on the riverfront will only continue to develop with even more uh, amenities and, and enhancements for runners, bikers, picnickers, uh, and everyone as we go through. So a little bit about connectivity and infrastructure. Uh, you see, uh, we are currently engaged. The meeting I just came from was parking solutions and transit solutions for the river market. Uh, we actually just advanced 
the project that you see at the top, that is the most dense green development uh, right next to Minsky's at Fifth and Main next in the city market. This will be converting a city owned parking lot that is never generated tax revenue into a 13 story 300 unit apartment building that will have 60 affordable units within those 300. Uh, we continue to develop those types of projects. Uh, the West Bottoms connection, we are really, um, uh, you know, the West Bottoms has so much potential. We are working with the Buck O'Neill Bridge, the Green Line, uh, and all of the partners on the levees in opening those back up to connect the West Bottoms. And uh, I personally am a fan of Rieger and the, uh, the, the whiskeys that they make and the cocktails they make. Uh, but the East Bottoms and into Independence Avenue and the, and the East Side is also really important. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, I, I tend to talk a little bit about these are longer uh, initiatives, but activating the river for um, uh, getting people back out on the rivers uh, a little bit more, getting citizens. They're, the river is very active with goods. As I said, 300,000 tons moved just out of our, our port a year, but activating the river, you know, in spite of its speed, it's an incredibly fast river and, and can be very dangerous, uh, but it can be great for um, uh, uh, river use of larger boats and, and services, as well as uh, activation, which is outside of my purview, uh, but I continue to be involved in it, is the Kansas River, the Caw River, Kansas River. It has both names. Um, that one's a much slower river that is much more conducive for kayaking and activation, as well as Harlem, which is the area just to the north of what we've been talking about in the Northland uh, around the downtown airport. How do we activate that as green space for the future? Um, as I said, Blue River Corridor, workforce, those are all vital to what we're trying to do here. Um, and these are some renderings. You'll see the eight, eight and nine story massing of the apartment complex. That's a 250 unit complex uh, that we're advancing right at the base of the bond bridge on less than an acre. And uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's the end of my slideshow because I was hoping uh, that this would spur a lot of questions from all of you. Uh, so with that, um, I will put it back on hopefully a map here and uh, answer any questions through Q&A that anyone has. Thank you, John, I appreciate that. Um, I have a couple of questions from the chat. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Um, Josh asked a little bit earlier, are there any plans for retail development near the Bannister complex? So, yeah, no, great question. So we have talked about that a lot. The the land, the, the land within the reclaimed area, so inside the development area of the former NSA facility, NNSA facility, even though it's been fully remediated, it is not conducive for house, multifamily housing or anything. However, we have uh, embraced with KCATA uh, and the neighborhood and the city, um, we certainly are supportive and I am personally pushing uh, to acquire and develop adjacent parcels, particularly on the truest face uh, from the from the the veterans uh, veteran services facilities south. I think there's a lot of opportunity there on the max line for multifamily and uh, uh, services, you know, uh, retail services. The other need here that we are interested in supporting and and even helping to fund is uh, enhanced daycare services for uh, the community in that neighborhood. Uh, we've seen a 40, and, and, and here I'm, I'm getting way out of my field of expertise, but I do know this, that there's been a 40% decline in number of seats for daycare services in the Kansas City Metro over the last two years. Um, and the people most hard hit are hourly workers uh, and those that are shift work. So we certainly are, um, are uh, looking to um, try to try to enhance and support that. That's phenomenal, thank you. Um, Mary asked what the brand of the bubbly water was um, because she wants uh, to support local. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for asking. So it is Niagara, Niagara Bottling. 
So they have their own Niagara bottling. Uh, and then they actually have a water facility where they do still water, bottled still water in South Kansas City at 49 Crossing. And then the new project is bubbly water that I don't know that it's public, but uh, they will do their own. And then they also produce significant private labeling for various, uh, various brands. Um, and I don't want to misspeak, so I will not say which ones because <laughs> I will get it wrong and then someone will yell at me. Um, but they produce, they're going to produce millions of cans and bottles uh, of that. And, and as I said, it's really exciting to see how they're looking at doing efficient use of that. Uh, as well as how they partner on uh, reclaiming uh, the glass and the cans and, and services there. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, was the Berkeley Riverfront the target location for the stadium or were there other ones considered? Yeah, um, I can tell you from my perspective, from my first meeting with Chris and Angie, obviously um, our goal, I, 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 I will speak on behalf of Chris and Angie since I know them pretty well. Um, this was once they really looked around this was their number one. This quickly became their number one idea uh, and number one location. Um, over the years, the riverfront had been pitched for dozens of ideas, you know, from ballparks to facilities to youth sports to everything. We're very sensitive to density of land use, um, but I'm a big believer in looking to the future for urban design models and looking to Europe and other places for urban design models. So while this takes up, you know, seven plus acres, to me, um, this is a really appropriate land use because it then sets the standard to do much denser vertical development and activation around it. So um, yes, I, I think ultimately this was their ultimate idea. We explored placing a practice and medicine, medical facility and practice facility and other things down here. And it was deemed that uh, the land was just too valuable uh, for future dense development to take up practice fields and other services. Um, but for the stadium and having this as the destination, uh, we really are excited about it. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I love hearing about all this stuff in the background. I know everybody else is just yeah. eating this up too. Thank you Good. so much for being Good. here. Um, Mary asked if the residences will have private parking or will they have shared parking? Uh, for the residents? Yes. Yes. Um, going forward, we are exploring different models where we will actually build the parking garages. So tenants, um, we're, we're moving to all new projects really are, are now 0.8 parking spaces per unit or less is our goal. Some are still at 0.1 or 1.0, uh, but we're moving the tenancy reserve tenant parking in these projects down to a less than one per door, uh, which is a big, a big gamble. But with that, we are maximizing the, the amount of, of, of flex ticket pull shared parking, as well as on street parking. Some of the things I neglected given the time constraints today um, is all of the riverfront roads uh, going forward, Port KC will own and operate and we're looking at, at app-based dynamic parking, paid parking, uh, so that uh, we're able to make this a, an accessible, cost-effective place, uh, but we're maximizing the input and output of parking here. Uh, and then we'll be financing, looking to finance the garages from multiple, from multiple parameters, uh, as I said, building on top of them and other things so that the parking garages themselves will be shared um, much like other communities. So there will still be lease spaces for tenants, um, but there'll be a lot of other spaces for the restaurants, the hotel, um, and as well as event use. Um, Jesse asked, what are some of the conservancy goals? Are yeah. there some ecosystem-based goals? Yeah. Great, great question. So we already own and manage um, the, uh, the Riverfront Heritage Trail, which is to the west. Uh, and that is, has wetlands. It has wetland habitat uh, as well as the trail. We are, um, we've set a goal, uh, in multiple things I'll, I'll touch on. 
is we've set a goal of, of uh, sustainable infrastructure as it relates to green infrastructure, that all tree replacement, all tree additions, all native indigenous, we're, we're doing controlled burns of the wetlands, it, which is in keeping with, with positive uh, design use for indigenous uh, uh, green infrastructure. And all of our tree additions will be native and indigenous uh, trees. Um, additionally, all of the actual hard surface development, every development on the riverfront utilizes, I've eliminated all stormwater runoff and detention ponds and things like that, preferring to uh, put those into native plantings. So all of our developments actually have below grade coffered uh, uh, stormwater catchments. So the current core apartments that are under construction, parcel 12, that you see on the screen uh, in the kind of yellow on the far left uh, of the screen, uh, that facility actually has hundreds of thousands of gallons of below grade catchments for stormwater that then will release back into the infrastructure. Um, so we are looking at that. We work heavily with the core on assessments. We're working with the Osage Indian uh, Nation on an assessment of 20 acres at the Blue River. Uh, and all of the projects we're uh, looking at along the Blue River corridor are going to include green infrastructure transfers for trail and, um, and, and green, greening of the Blue River uh, itself to give more easement back off of the Blue River, uh, which should hopefully green that. Additionally, I mentioned Harlem. Um, we're working with the core and the federal government on what the future could look like for all of that and maintaining that as a floodable green space and not building levees uh, you know, up further, but maintaining that as a floodable green space that is beneficial to the river, but also um, is more accessible to the public. Because fundamentally, we believe the more recreational access and visibility that we can get people to the river, the more conservation conscious they're gonna be for the future. Hopefully that answers your question. I think it was a great, great answer. It does. That's all really great. And I could listen to you talk all day just about those topics. Thank you. Well, I could, I could talk all day. I was on a four hour panel last year on water conservancy and water, uh, water overflow at a national level. So I'm happy to do that at another time. I won't bore everyone on this call with that, but yeah, yes. We're going to put your name down. <laughs> <laughs> um, Josh asked how Port Casey funds the streetcar expansion into the riverfront. Is it yeah. public, private, federal? Yep. We'd like to hear a bit on that, please. Yeah, so, um, so our funding, uh, we, as I said, we receive no tax dollars, but we do have some rights and privileges through Chapter 68 of collecting rent, land sales, land leases, uh, and reversionary land sales. So we're, I like to say that really, you know, we're a transportation logistics agency at heart, but we're built on the model of, of, of finance. We're a, we're a finance organization in many instances. So that's how I grow, um, grow the reinvestment revenue for that. So for the streetcar, the riverfront was originally excluded out of the, the TDD, the Transportation Development District, that the rest of the streetcar is funded through. So over the, the three years, we've set aside 50 plus percent of our land leases and land sales on the riverfront to private developers. When those dollars have come in, we've set those aside as reserves for funding the streetcar. We were then able to leverage a, um, a, a, almost a $14 million federal uh, build grant which then our share of that funding is the millions that we uh, match with the federal grant that then enables this. And then all of the entire riverfront will pay an additional 1% port improvement district, which is similar to a CID. We have a little bit different mechanism, but ours is a CID. So the, um, the stadium, all of the retail, all pay a, will pay a, uh, a port improvement district assessment that will then um, go into the operations and maintenance of the streetcar. Very good. 
Yeah. I think we have one left and it is from Sam and he wants to know if you have talked to the Corps of Engineers to see uh -huh. about slowing down the speed of the river to make it more accessible for recreational use. Yeah, um, that probably is not going to happen in my lifetime. However, however, I will say that um, the river can still be, uh, and, and Sam, uh, it sounds like you know, you, you, you have an expertise here. You know, the river, the river speeds up as it heads south because it narrows due to the levees uh, as it comes south. Then when it makes the hard turn at Caw Point, it continues to be constricted and it is a self-scouring river. So we maintain navigable river depth almost exclusively through the speed of the river, moving the material below the, the surface to keep that channel deep. So there is a lot that goes into that. Um, slowing the river at this bend would re probably require removing levees, which would require buying land out. And it ha would have to come from Fairfax or the West Bottoms or the downtown airport, most likely. There may be other ways, um, but what we're focused on, uh, and, and I'll end with, you know, I, I'm a historian at heart and a, and a believer of reclaim, reclamation at heart. So we did, if, if you're familiar with the town of Kansas Bridge, which is the pedestrian bridge, um, the pedestrian bridge that takes you down over the rail at Main Street in the River Market, we own and manage that cool pedestrian overlook and bridge and we connect it down to the riverfront. On either side are two 100-year-old wharf structures, big concrete, the size of football fields almost, that actually conducted a $48,000 engineering study this past year that determined those are still structurally sound. So our ultimate goal is twofold. It's to reopen those, in some way that's usable and accessible to the public. So put rails on the outside of them. Um, additionally, the core, we've sought preliminary approval either at Berkeley Park or at other points in our landhold to put floating dock access to the riverfront, which then would open it up for navigation, movement of boats and access. Um, so we are looking at all of that. Um, and we have approval on that. Moving the structural side, and as you said, uh, the, uh, the wing dikes and some other things with offset, this section is pretty difficult, particularly with the new Buck O'Neill going in and other things of, of looking at some of the slowing of it here. But I will also talk about the, the, the Caw River interface and the uh, Mike Zeller and the bridge over there on the KCK side. There is immense potential there, and I'm committed to Port KC playing a bi-state role of connecting the access points there to really reactivate the West Bottoms on the, the west side for recreational kayak river purposes, and then hopefully connect that via uh, some sort of navigable boats to take people to and from uh, because there were, I mean, I, I'm old, again, I'm old enough to remember when there were riverboats running, um, not the old ones, but the modern ones in the 90s. Um, there were uh, ticketed riverboats that you could get rides on. And we have had discussions. I was recently, um, pre, just pre-COVID, um, I had had several meetings with Viking Cruises and their, their European cruises on the potential they were, they were looking at activating a New Orleans to St. Louis uh, cruise line, barge cruise line, was met with them looking at activating a St. Louis to Kansas City or even a New Orleans to Kansas City jazz heritage multi-day cruise, cruise uh, facility. So we have the ability to do that. Um, we have the approvals to do that. We've just got to find the user who's willing to invest uh, in all of those uh, that type of activation, and then we're ready to do it. That sounds fantastic. It looks like you hit some memories there. Dinner cruises on those. Yeah, riverboats. dinner cruises. I actually had a high school prom on one of the dinner cruise riverboats in Kansas City when, so I, uh, when I was a high school senior. So I, I'm well aware, well aware. Uh, we have one more question from Jesse. 
And yeah. it says, uh, is the multifamily portion going to be affordable and to help with less gentrification downtown? Ooh. And that's an excellent question. Thank you. Excellent. Guys. Excellent question. So um, that's another one that I would be glad to have a separate master's class and brainstorming on. Amen. But uh, yes, the, the answer is we have applied with private developers for five different LIHTC projects that would be affordable on the riverfront. None of those five have been funded because of the limitations of the availability of LIHTC, low-income housing tax credits. Every project we're developing has a percentage of units set aside. So one of the projects that's being uh, advanced and is coming up in February, 250 unit project right in front of the core apartments in front of Barquet, that will have 10% of units set aside at 30% median family income and 10% of units at 70% median family income. Additionally, the core apartments have 15% of units at 70% median family income. The uh, project I mentioned in the River Market uh, has 20% of units in blended uh, of affordable and income restricted. All of our projects going forward will have a percentage that is set aside. That does a lot to assist, but I will be the first to say that that helps mitigate mitigate some of the uh, some of the cost increases. But it certainly doesn't solve the need for affordable housing. That's also why we worked with HUD and with a developer uh, to reclaim and reuse a project. We're doing two different projects on Paseo that will bring collectively around uh, 500 new units that are fully HUD voucher restricted and, and, and program restricted. And then one of the developers that we have worked with has committed to 1,300 new affordable units in the next three years. So we're very committed to it, but we don't always have the, the tools. I would say if there's something that the private development community could do, it's to lobby and advocate for federal, direct federal funding and LIHTC funding and tax credit funding and voucher funding uh, for getting more people into uh, uh, quality housing that's accessible to jobs. So I saw, sorry, I've got to jump in. I saw, when do the Royals move downtown? Well, you never know. Um, but uh, I, I, think, uh, I think we will see them move downtown and, and make that move at some point. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, John. We appreciate you and your brain. Sounds like it could just go on and on for hours. <laughs> I, I love doing this. I hope, uh, I hope uh, if, if I could have one takeaway, it's that each of you found something that you're interested in and care about. And uh, please spread the word, reach out, share. We are a, a, an organization of professionals that absolutely, um, one of the things I, I will end with is we can't do it all but we certainly are a hub and we try to bring all of these different partners from the local federal state levels to the table. We are a convener and we are a convener that also puts our, our, uh, our, our, our loud voices. I'm not a shy person, as you can tell, um, put it loud voices and expertise uh, and as available investments at the table. Yeah, if you wanna reach out to me, uh, it's jstevens at portkc.com. Sorry, I don't have that on here. That's another COVID brain thing that I forgot about when I was putting this all together. But please, I can send stuff out. I would love to come speak to any of your groups or organizations. Uh, and we have other great talent at the table. So thank you very much for the time.